Thanks, George. Uh, certainly, uh, Ischemia has already generated uh, significant controversy, and it'll be uh, fascinating to see how this works. So this is another challenging topic, uh, how to manage large thrombus. I uh, have no disclosures. So large thrombus is bad. This is the best take home point for the day. So if you see on the left side, you see uh, thrombus grade four, and on the right side, you see thrombus grade five. And as an interventionalist, when we see either one of those, we say bad. If you look at it acutely, you have increased slow flow, increased no reflow, increased infarct size. At 30 day, there's an increase in stent thrombosis, an increase in mortality. And long term, there's a stent malapposition uh, and late and very late stent thrombosis. So we know that's true. So is the size and the amount of thrombus really important? The answer is yes. And if you look at it, it's important to understand the thrombus grade. What is large thrombus? So the thrombus grade is zero, is no angiographic thrombus. Uh, one is possible, two is thrombus is present, three is moderate size, and then four is large, uh, and five is total occlusion. Well, I'll also point out, so large thrombus, we all know that there's total occlusions that you dilate and it's gone and there's very little thrombus. So this is one of the challenges of clinical trials in this area of how we define this, okay? But when you look at large thrombus being four and five, uh, uh, cumulative MACE, every single trial shows more worse outcomes with large thrombus, okay? This is data from the total trial. You can see increased death, increased cardiogenic shock, heart failure, increased stroke. So it's bad. Now, this is a proposed figure for how do we do this, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the data. So if you look on the right, open artery, thrombus burden, if it's low, direct stent, if it's moderate, aspiration, if it's high, rheolytic thrombectomy. But we all know that this is really not what we do, and that there isn't really an algorithm to approach this, and then we're gonna show that here. So what are the key things? Number one, the pharmacologic therapy. You need to have anti-pharmacologic therapy on board, and we're gonna talk about that. And then the next one is the mechanical part, and we'll touch base on aspiration, both passive and active, embolic protection, and then some new devices. So what is the optimal pharmacotherapy? It's not clear. Okay, we really don't know. So what we need to say is that we need an antithrombin. There's really arguments for using bivirudin. Uh, it's actually bivirudin is mostly decreased in the United States, mostly because of cost, and now we're using heparin. In terms of uh, antiplatelet therapy, um, it's really, this is one of the indications where the guidelines say that GPI use might be the most appropriate with large EMI and large thrombus burden. But it's not really based on data and it's certainly not compared to um, P2I12 in particular with Kangalore. Uh, and we also know that there's increased bleeding. So if you look at it, clearly P2I12 inhibition is a critically important factor. We know that with STEMI and a lot of these patients, if you do oral agents, you have inadequate P2I12 on board. So I would tell you that from my standpoint, my practice has changed, that for me, with large thrombus burden, Kangalore has been an incredibly important thing because you turn it on and you have basically effective um, P2I12 inhibition um, and then you can have time for the oral agents to work. Whether Kangalore is better than 2B3 inhibitors, we have zero idea. Uh, it hasn't been compared. So we all agree thrombus is a problem. What about the mechanical parts? Why are all the trials negative? I do thrombectomy, it works, right? You've heard this. It feels good, but is there any benefit for patients? So let's go through a little of the mechanical devices. So you have embolic protection, you have passive and active um, uh, thrombus aspiration. This is embolic protection, absolutely no benefit uh, when you get to multi-center trials of using embolic protection. Um, so it, there's no data for using embolic protection at all although clearly all of us have used it and there's times when you think that it might be effective. Certainly I think um, it, on a case-by-case -case basis there clearly is times when I feel still a very large ectatic right coronary where I think it might be helpful to me. What about AngioJet? So this was actually a thing. I actually helped develop the AngioJet uh, you know, early on in my career. Clearly it's effective, but what about the AMI trial? It actually was worse to use AngioJet.
So I think the, the fact is very few people use it now just because it's problematic, because you have heart block, um, and then uh, mostly because of the switch to aspiration thrombectomy. Easy to use, you always bring out clot, um, and uh, so this should work, right? Well, why not? Well, the technique's not clear. There's a lot of variation in the devices. Thrombus is often left, uh, and you have the problem with stroke. So let's look at the trials, and I'm not gonna go through this exhaustive, but what happened is, TAPAS trial came out, significant reduction. Well, these event rates as a single center, these event rates were a little higher than you would expect for the conventional PCI to start with. So I think there was people that were concerned about that. But what happened after the TAPAS trial? This was the increase in thrombectomy use. People looked at it and believed it and did it, and it raised, it actually got uh, over 50% in many places. So then the TASTE trial, which is a multi-center randomized trial, came out, showed absolutely no benefit. And if you look at that, look at the difference between TAPAS, which is shown there, and TASTE, which is a multi-center trial, and you can see the event rates were right in the middle. So no benefit at all. And then the total trial, I think, sealed the deal. Again, no significant difference between uh, thrombectomy or elective and an increased stroke weight with thrombectomy. So it actually raised the issue of, is routine throm aspiration thrombectomy actually worse? And in fact, if you look at the guidelines now, the routine use is a class three indication. And the selective use is 2B. All right, and we're gonna talk about selective. So this is what happens. So increased use, taste and total come out, decreased use. So at least we're listening. The issue is for us is that this oculothrombotic reflex, and we all have cases where you've done thrombectomy and it, you feel like it's been effective, right? Um, and this is what you get. Uh, the question is, does it really matter? So where are we now, what to do personally? Do we use Kangalor, do you two, do 2B3 two inhibitors? Not sure. And I think you have to do, get an idea of what you're effective with. My personal approach now uh, is with Kangalor. Pre-treat with vasodilators, never shown to be effective, uh, probably doesn't hurt. Selective thrombectomy, is there a role? Well, this is actually data from almost 100,000 people from uh, the United Kingdom. No benefit from selective thrombectomy, none. So, uh, yeah, and this is a problem, even when you do thrombectomy, if you look at OCT, there's incomplete thrombus removal. So, um, the next issue is what about uh, uh, lytics? Uh, certainly, uh, we've all, again, used this, and there's times when it might have worked. It's all off-label. Uh, there's certainly times when I, it might be effective, but I think it's rarely used, uh, and you have the problem of increased bleeding. So, based on that data, we shouldn't be surprised of this. This is data that just came from JAMA Cardiology, and it shows that the variability an interventional cardiologist is from 0% use to 83% use. Not surprising when you look at what the challenges are with the data. And this is actually what's really happening is the frequency of aspiration thrombectomy has continued to drop, uh, and probably correctly. So the last thing I mean is we're gonna need a bigger boat, is it will be a better device. And I'm, I actually personally uh, haven't used the penumbra, but I have no people that have. And it's certainly, I think, a, uh, a new tool that deserves uh, looking at. So it's sort of power aspiration. There's data that shows that it's much more effective than manual aspiration, and it's much more effective than than uh, the angiojet. So this is an example of a case uh, where you get actually more complete and better aspiration. Will it be actually a place, will have a place in, uh, in, uh, in thrombus grade four and five? It's possible. But I think I'll end that with these conclusions. Large thrombus is bad, treatment requires judgment. Adequate pharmacotherapy is absolutely essential and make sure that you've done that, but which one, whether you use Kangalore or a 2B3 inhibitor, we really don't know. And then I think selective mechanical thrombectomy for really large clots is appropriate, but we still need better uh, options. And the problem, I'll leave it this, is the trials are challenging. It's because it's hard to randomize people because either you have to select out just thrombus grade four and five, and I would argue that five is really not, frequently not that much thrombus. So if you take those, and those patients are usually sick, it's an acute thing, so randomizing them is challenging. So 
Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate to be here. I'm not sure I helped learn, taught you anything, Yotter, but thrombus is bad. Thank you, guys.